Good morning, Christ Community Church. Would you help me welcome our guests, Will and Matt? Hey, let me just say up front, if your ear is picking up, uh, you know, some popping in the sound system, some, uh, we had some weird stuff happen at the service last night, and our technician stayed two hours afterward last night, and we're still trying to troubleshoot and find the problem. If you thought it was really cool during worship that the band backed out on occasion and allowed you to sing a cappella, that was not <laughs> intentional. Okay, it was, the, it was the sound cut out during that. So uh, we're, we're armed with extra mics up here and whatever. So uh, you just keep praying that we get through this interview without our sound going on us. Uh, but I'm excited about what you're about to hear because someone flipped this book to me uh, a year ago, the, the Dream King. And when I got done reading it, I thought, I want to meet these guys, and I'd love to have them at Christ Community Church. So that is our privilege today to get to hear the story uh, that I think is going to change your life just as it changed their lives. Now, you guys are really good buds with each other, yeah. but we don't know you from Boo. So <laughs> I'm going to start with a little game here to give us a chance to get to know you. Okay. And uh, the game is the favorites game. So I'm going to give a bunch of categories. You tell me your favorites. By the way, if they name a favorite of yours, yeah, make some noise, okay? <laughs> so even if you're watching online, make some noise in your living room, all right? So favorite sport. Favorite sport, basketball. Basketball. Yeah. yeah, we got some hoops guys out there. Favorite team of basketball? Um, the Golden State Warriors, except for when they're playing the Mavericks. So that's, yeah. I like Steph Curry, but not as much as my home team, the Dallas Mavericks. I'm a Hoosier. So I got to show some love for the Pacers. Yeah. Okay, how about favorite, favorite musical artist? Favorite musical artist... Uh, I'm going to say Jason Upton. He's one of my favorites. Okay. Okay. Oh, I've got on, on repeat right now someone named Victory Boyd. You yes. want to look her up? She's amazing. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Victory Boyd. Yeah. Okay. How about hobby, leisure activity, favorite? Reading. I love to read. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Got yeah. Readers in the house, right. <laughs> Nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Motorcycles. Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> but, and, and kind of motorcycle? Uh, I got a Harley, a couple BMWs, and okay. a whole okay. lot of fun. Wait a second. I thought Harley riders didn't own other kinds of I know. Cars. Like, if I, if I go out on the BMW, the Harley guys won't wave at yes. me. So, <laughs> so I got to be back on the Harley. Uh, favorite ethnic food? Favorite ethnic food? I'm going to say Tex-Mex. Okay, because you live, I live close here. by. I live, yeah. Close, yeah, yep. I live in Texas, yep. yeah. Dim sum. Crickets. No takers? Come on. <laughs> Last yeah, night you had one yeah, person. Sure, sure. We're Googling it right now. What are you talking about? Favorite subject in school? Favorite subject in school for me, I, I was a banking and finance major. I love studying the economic systems. And so I don't know. That, there was. <laughs> so. We got two bankers out there applauding right, 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 right now. So favorite subject in school? <laughs> History for me. Okay, yeah. good, good, good. I'm a history guy, but I love studying the monetary yeah, system. Yeah, you love the history of the monetary system. Exactly yeah. right. uh, you're still boring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite movie? Favorite movie? I'm going to say um, Field of Dreams. Ah, uh, classic. Yeah. Great baseball movie. It's hard to beat that. I'm going to say Darkest Hour. Darkest mm -hmm. Hour, some Winston Churchill stuff, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. A favorite vacation spot? Where do you like to go to get away? Cabo San Lucas. Oh, wow. oh, never yeah. been, but seen pictures. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, I love it. Yeah. yeah. Any snowbirds here? Clearwater Beach? Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. No? Yeah. No? <laughs> yeah, just, just, just got back from Florida, and the, you know, the hardest part wasn't readjusting to the cold. It was readjusting to the masks. Uh, but, <gasps> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just saying, okay. <laughs> Favorite dessert? Favorite dessert, I'm going to say tiramisu. tiramisu. Oh, oh, yeah. He had some last night, I had actually. it for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty traditional. I love apple pie. Yeah. Okay, okay. Pie or cake? Uh, yeah, see, there it is, pie. <laughs> a la mode? A la mode? Or, yeah, okay. You're a la mode guy or no? Favorite season of the year? Spring. 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 You live in Dallas. What? They only got spring. I know, but, summer, but when yeah. we do get a spring, it's 
Precious. Okay. I hold okay. on to it. Yeah. Okay. It's either hot or cold. Yeah. Yeah, spring for me. Okay. Yeah. Does anybody else out there love winter like I do? Come on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Two. Yeah, all three of us. <laughs> We're going to stick together. Uh, last one. Favorite app on your phone? Favorite app on my phone, my Bible app. Okay, that works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything I say at this point is going to sound very unspiritual. If you're yeah, going to leave yeah, with that. Yeah, yeah. So if I say Google Maps, that doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you you guys have got this unusual friendship, and we're going to get into how you met and whatever. But what are the qualities you look for in a good friend? Since we're going to be mm. talking about friendship. For me, quality and friendships. You know, the whole scripture: iron sharpening iron. I look for somebody that um, I look for authenticity, but I look for somebody who's a listener. I also look for somebody who's Kind of matches wits with me a little bit. Uh, not that he does, but yeah, somebody kind of. <laughs> <laughs> you're still, still looking? Is you're still, that what you're I'm still looking, you know. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But um, yeah, somebody who's, who holds me accountable for how I do life in God. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And, and, oh, and Matt, Matt does that. Okay. Mm, yeah, for me, I think it's probably loyalty for one thing. Yeah. Uh, but also just honesty, not just somebody d being honest with me, but somebody I can be honest with and yes. not be judged for it. You know? yes. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. So how did you guys meet? Wow, how did we meet? We, we met at the Lincoln Memorial on MLK Celebration Day, January 17, 2005, in a prayer meeting. That's, that's how we met. A prayer rally at the Lincoln Memorial. Yeah. Wow, wow. Now, let's, let's get into that story. Okay. Um, your ancestors were slaves in our country, mm -hmm. and they passed on to you this artifact. By the way, someone was joking with me ahead of time. They said, it's probably this kettle that's throwing off the sound system. It's, <laughs> it's creating waves. But this, this is actually your kettle. You brought right. this with you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so give us some background. What, what is this thing all about? There's something about the acoustics of this the, kettle. The acoustics yes, of the yeah. kettle. So this was passed down in my family at least seven generations believed to be about 200 years old, used by the slaves in my family. They used it for cooking, they used it for washing clothes, but it was passed down because secretly they used it in their prayer meetings. So the story is told to me that, uh, well, our grandmother, that uh, this was used uh, as an acoustic means to keep the prayer meetings. So back then, they wanted slaves to be Christians because they knew the Christian slaves made better workers, but they would pervert the gospel and say, slaves be obedient to your masters if you want to go to heaven. So when they were saved by grace through faith, not of works, it's a gift of God so that no one should boast, but it was easy to teach slaves that back then because it was against the law for slaves to read and write. It was also against the law for anybody to teach them how to read and write. So the irony is that while they wanted them to be Christians, they didn't want them to pray because they felt like prayer would foster hope. They got hopeful. These folks would try to run away. So they would literally be beaten if they were caught praying. We, we actually had stories in our family passed down about a, a great uncle who was beat to death simply for going fishing without asking. So, he went fishing without asking and yeah, got beaten. And, and wow. got beaten. So that's how wow. slavery was there in Lake Providence, Louisiana, where this uh, kettle came from, where my grandfather and my dad grew up. But in spite of the danger and because of the love for Jesus, the, the Christians who were enslaved in my family, they decided to pray anyway. Wow. So they would go into a barn late at night to make sure their prayer meeting wasn't seen, but to make sure it wasn't heard, they used this pot. And so they would go into the middle of the cabin floor and invert it. They would turn it upside down on the cabin floor then prop it up with like three or four rocks that'll be suspended off the ground about an inch or two. Yeah. They would then prostrate themselves on the ground and put their lips in between the opening, between the ground and the kettle, so that the kettle pot muffle their voices as they prayed through the night. Wow, wow. And the story that they passed down with this pot is this, that they didn't think they would see freedom in their time, so they prayed for the freedom of their children in the next generation. Wow. So one day, freedom comes, there's this young teenage girl who decides to keep this pot, that story, in our family. So she passed the pot and the story down to Harriet Lockett, Harriet Lockett passed it on to Noah Lockett. Noah Lockett passed it on to her son, William Ford Sr., who passed it on to William Ford Jr., who then gave it to me, William Ford III. Wow, cool yeah. story, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> wow. So, so let's talk about slavery for, mm -hmm. for a moment here. Your ancestors are slaves, but that's a long, long time ago. Right. In, in fact, Will, you've grown, grown up post-civil rights stuff and whatever, so... Yeah. Uh, Racism is no longer a problem in our country, right? I mean, you didn't grow up, in, you didn't grow up with any racism, did you? Yeah, I, unfortunately, I did. I experienced a couple of things growing up. Uh, when I was 13 years old, I was coming out of a convenience store. Three other friends, we're all around the same age, and a carload full of white guys pulled up, started shouting the N-word at us, said they're going to mm. shoot and kill us. 
they chased us for almost two hours. Uh, they probably joyriding, but yeah. you know, we, were, we were terrified. I know what it's like later on, uh, I'm in my 30s, get my first nice house in the suburbs, but I had the same police officer. Every week for the first three months, he would pull me over just for driving while black. I know, I know what that feels like. Wow, so, wow. Yeah. So how did that leave you, what feeling did that leave you with? What, what impact did it have in your life? Uh, it, beyond the humiliation of it, it just gave me a filter, especially for people in that area where I grew up. I saw white people and I saw police through the veil of those experiences. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in today's culture, uh, CRT, critical race theory, mm -hmm. has kind of redefined racism and it's all in, you know, in terms of power. Right. So only, mm -hmm. the only people who could be racist are people who have power. So in our yeah. culture, that would be white folks can be racist, but people of color can't struggle with racism. Right. But the classical definition of racism is it's just looking down or looking with animosity mm -hmm. at a person who, you know, is of a different hue than you. Is, right. Is it possible that racism is pervasive and that everybody could potentially struggle with it? Well, the way I like to put it is like this. The devil is an equal opportunity employer when it comes to hate. Yeah. <laughs> and so you have people uh, who are ethnic minorities who are now moving in positions of power who do have sometimes preferential ways of looking at class or looking at other people of different skin color. And so the devil's equal opportunity employer when it comes to this stuff. And so he's, he's our real enemy in this whole thing. Okay. So, so you, you don't have to be a particular color to, to be no. guilty of hate. No, and no. Have hate, hate and, it, yes. and I don't subscribe to the extreme thoughts within CRT, which say all white people are perpetual racists, all black people are perpetual right. victims. Uh, I don't think that's, that's necessarily the case. Yeah. Now, will God gave you a dream and it just you know the book is called the dream king and obviously it calls to mind martin luther king jr's famous speech i have a dream speech uh but it also is a reflection of the fact that god put a dream in your head mm -hmm. and uh t you know tell us what was in this dream there was you know there was a white bag with black right, handles right, right. and whatever <laughs> it, it was this really unique dream um i was I'm going to speak actually at Dr. King's old church in Dexter, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church where he started his ministry. But the night before, I had this dream with Dr. King in it. So in the dream, we had to go pick up Dr. King. And uh, it, it's a dream, so he's alive. But in the <laughs> dream, he, he comes out of this house to get in the car with us, but he has this humongous white duffel bag with black handles on it. And then the dream, he starts emptying out all this dark garbage within that bag and throws the bag down violently. And he comes to get into this vehicle with us. And in the dream, I thought to myself, man, that bag can make a nice souvenir. This, like shows you how carnal I am. Like even in my dreams, I'm thinking, I went to Morehouse College, went to Morehouse College, the bag can make a nice souvenir, that's what I thought. <laughs> so in the dream, I go to try to pick up the baggage, but before I could touch it, in the dream, Dr. King grabs me by my shoulders and he says, no, do not go back and pick that up. And he starts telling me what I need to do to heal the racial divide in our nation. And I woke up in the dream in tears. I remember crying in the dream, but woke up my pillow was soaked with tears. I've been weeping the whole night in prayer and didn't realize it. Wow. Shared it with my good friend uh, who was with me, and he begins to weep. And I start praying. What is the interpretation for this yeah, dream? God, yeah. remind me. What did Dr. King say to me? And the Lord basically impressed upon me, on this, uh, impressed upon me with this one thing. William, it's about the white bag with the black candles. And I remember how the candles, I just saw how the black candles represented my ethnicity as an African-American man. And the, and the white baggage represented my unforgiveness issues that with the things I experienced. In other words, God was saying to me, will you get rid of your white baggage yeah. so you can get into a new vehicle that can bring revival and justice for everybody? And so um, I think that's what God is saying to us all right now. Like I said before, you know, I was seeing everybody through, in that area through the veil of those experiences. Yeah. Before I had one conversation with a police officer or a white person from that area, I put those, I had those presuppositions and those stereotypes I placed on them. And that's, that's what the devil loves to do. He's, yeah. the, he's the accuser of the brethren. And the word accuser in Revelation 12, it comes from this Greek word, kategoros. is where we get the word category. Mm -hmm. So the diabolical plot of the enemy is to get us to categorize or stereotype each other. Yes. So before we have one conversation with each other, yeah. we put some bad stigma, some bad stereotype on each other. So God was saying to me, get rid of your unforgiveness, get rid of your bitterness, get rid of your resentment, get rid of your white baggage. And I think that's what God is saying to the church right now. What color is your baggage? Yeah, yeah. You know? You, you, you know what strikes me about your, 
your dream as well. Is that, that, that baggage image, that could be applied to stuff beyond your hatred toward people of, yes. a, of a different race or your resentments, your bitterness. You know, we all carry baggage. Your yep. baggage may be your materialism. It may mm -hmm. be uh, your anger. It may be, you know, uh, someone you haven't forgiven. It may be lust. It could, right. you know, and, and coming to God means get rid of the, get rid of the baggage. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And even too, how we see each other through this, this political lens. I mean, you know, from everything we saw on the extreme left with 410 cities set on fire uh, to the extreme right with January 6th left right wing, the whole bird is sick. It's not about the donkey, the elephant right now. It's about the lamb. Yeah. And it's going to take a united church to heal a divided nation. Yeah. Amen. You agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. So when you talk about God giving you a dream, yeah. it presupposes that there is this conversational relationship going on with God. Mm -hmm. So we love to talk about it here at Christ Community Church, yeah. especially when we have inspiring stories weekends. We'd like to hear from our guests. So how did you begin a relationship with Jesus? You know, what, what transpired to cause you to surrender your life to him? Well, I remember six years old, of course, being baptized, but not, nearly, not, not really knowing much of what that was about. But it wasn't until I was in my 20s and I went through a series of just trying to earn God's love and earn God's favor, earn his acceptance through uh, some of the churches that I was involved in. And, Honestly, there was a lot of legalism that was going on there. And so finally, I got tired. And I said, God, you know, I'm so tired of trying to give you my life. And I was reading through the book of Romans, and I got to the scripture where it says, and you will be saved by his life, Christ's life. And I realized God wasn't trying to, he didn't want me to give me his life. He wanted me to receive his life as a gift. And when I realized that salvation was a gift and that I couldn't earn it, it so freed me. It so changed my life. When I understood the grace of God and truth in that dimension, everything changed in my, in my Christian walk. Yeah. Okay, Matt, I'm going to move over to you. Yeah. Uh, let's go back to that MLK rally mm -hmm. where, you met, uh, where you met Will. What was going on in your life at the time? You know, that was a really interesting time for me because it, you know, Will mentioned it was January 16th, 2005. And that was an important date for me because exactly one year before then, I lost my dad unexpectedly when he passed away. And, you know, when you go through something like that, you know, at that point, I, I became a Christian when I was 15. I was now, you know, an adult, married, had kids of my own. But when you go through something like that, it, it can have, you know, one of those effects where it just kind of throws you for a tailspin. Yeah. And something happens during those times. And I, I, I describe it like this, where... You've been receiving everything from your parents your whole life, the stories, provision, everything. But when you lose them, suddenly now you become the steward of the storyline, you know? And yeah, so for yeah, me, yeah. That, 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 was, uh, that was going on. I, I, I became really fascinated. And, and at that time, it was important to me to find out something about my family. Because in my dad's family, we had no idea where the lockets came from. And so I wanted to just dig and research and find out. I didn't really understand why. But, you know, I was digging into the family tree and, you know, one thing led to another. And next thing I know on the anniversary of that, of his passing is when I met Will. Okay. And it is tied into a dream as well. So this Dream King book, you guys both had dreams. Yeah. So you're, in your dream, you're told to go look for this guy named Lou. So <laughs> you, you, you wake up and you go looking yeah. for Lou. What, is, what does Lou tell you to do? It, it was so weird. You know, during that real painful time, I had a dream. And we're talking about the kind when you go to sleep at night and you think God's talking and pizza doesn't get all the credit. It's yeah, one of those yeah, kinds yeah. of dreams. Mm -hmm. So I had this dream and God talked to me about how he's going to change things in the nation. And there was a man in my dream that I didn't know. I had no idea who he was, and uh, after I woke up, found out it was a real guy, and he's really doing something with prayer, and so I, I reached out to him. I got a hold of somebody that worked with him and told him my dream, and they said, you know, this is really fascinating. We're going to do a prayer meeting on the, on the memorial steps on Martin Luther King Day. Maybe you should come to it, and so I, I thought it was weird. If you think it's weird, try living it. It's hard, <laughs> <laughs> but I went, showed up, didn't know what was going on. Wow. Wow. First wow. place Will and I came Okay, together. so let me ask you the same question I asked Will. Mm -hmm. It kind of presupposes, if God's speaking to you in a dream, that you've got this relationship with God. How did your relationship with God begin? 
Yeah, you know, Pastor, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. There wasn't any, anyone in my family that were Christian, so no one was speaking into my life in that way. And I'm so thankful because when I was 15 years old, one of my friends in public school shared his faith with me. I later found out I was the first person he had ever mustered up enough courage to share his <laughs> faith, uh, and it worked. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was 15 years old. God got a hold of me, and, you know, I wasn't a bad kid by, you know, most standards, but uh, I learned at a young age that it wasn't about me being good or bad, that it didn't matter how good I was, I couldn't earn my way into heaven. We all need Jesus, and mm -hmm. that's something that's never left me, you know, my entire life. I've never walked away from the Lord, but I've also never had a thought that I needed to earn his love or that I could somehow be good enough to get in. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. work that way. Yeah, yeah. you know, that's a, it's a crazy thing when you stop and think about it, but we, you know, I think a lot of us grow up with this uh, scales yes. thing, like, like if our good can just outweigh <laughs> our bad. Right. And, but the funny thing is, is when we, we, we try to evaluate our goodness, we always do it by looking at, at people who are worse than us. We, we never look up, you know. No. You, you compare yourself with some dirt bag, you know, and you say, I'm feeling pretty good. You don't compare yourself with Mother Teresa, right? That's right, yeah. right. So, and, and if you compare yourself with God's standard, mm -hmm. which is slightly higher than Mother Teresa, you know, no, none of us could yeah. measure up. We, we need a savior. Yes, we sir. need a savior. So, you go to this deal, this gig at, in Washington, D.C. at the Lincoln Memorial, and you meet Will, and your friendship begins. Um, were you aware of racism in your life at, at, at the time? I mean, how did this, how did this relationship, mm -hmm. you're a white guy, Will's a black guy, how did this relationship impact your view of racism in your own heart or in the country at large? Yeah, you know, that's a, a good question because... Uh, I think particularly in the last couple of years, right, that's the question that gets asked a lot is, you know, are you a racist? And, yeah. and of course, everyone's response is, no, I'm not. But, you know, there's a whole lot more nuance to it because it may not be, you know, it's not so much the overt racism, you know, that we can all see in our stand. It's more the, the insidious stuff that you can't see. So just for me, it was my friendship with Will that, that helped me begin to look at things from a different perspective, you know, get out of an echo chamber, you know, and, and, uh, it wasn't so much that I discovered that there was racism in my life, it's just that I gained a fresh perspective and a new perspective, you know, that, that wasn't my own. Okay. So you're getting to know him, and he, he's told you this story about his kettle, yeah, and, yeah. And, 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 and he's rehearsed for you the fact that he's got these ancestors who passed the kettle on, and one of the ancestors is named Lockett, and your last name's Lockett. Did, did, did a light go on? Did it, you know, this was a moment of revelation. Did you, you put the two together? Well, you know, it was, it, it piqued our interest, but you know, he started to quiz me that first night we met and our Lockett's spelled the name slightly differently. We spelled it with two T's. He spelled it with one. Mm -hmm. My dad's family was from Kentucky. His family was down in Louisiana. So honestly, we just thought it was a coincidence. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so you didn't suspect anything. After that point, uh, he was the first locket I met, and so I quizzed him. But it, it was enough to connect us as friends, and we just thought it was this cool coincidence. At first. Yeah. yeah. And this friendship goes on for 10 years without you guys yeah. knowing that there's any connection deeper than that. Right. right. Until you go to another prayer rally. God, you guys hang out <laughs> a lot of prayer gatherings, all right? It's well, kind of what we do. <laughs> this one is at the, uh, near the Appomattox Courthouse mm -hmm. in Virginia, mm -hmm. which is a, a very famous place, if you remember, your American, your U.S. history. Tell us what went down there, what surprising revelation you came across. Well, you know, once again, I was with our mutual friend that I had seen in my dream originally, and we went to Appomattox Courthouse, and that's where General Lee surrendered to Grant. That marks the end of the Civil War, the war that ended slavery. But we went into the Visitor's Center there, because it's like a historical site, and my friend and I stood at, at this little bookcase and he grabbed the first book, the first book off the shelf that caught his eye and opens it to a random page. And another coincidence, right? Mm -hmm. And we were stunned because it was called The Last Shot, The Battle of Lockett's Farm, spelled with two T's. And of course, that's my name. And we thought, well, that's unusual. And, you know, we started researching and digging. And what I found out is that, that the very last battle of the Civil War was fought in the front yard of a family named Lockett. It's called the Battle yeah, of Lockett's Farm. Yeah. Now, prior to this, as I understand it from reading your book, 
Prior to this, you had not been able to trace your ancestry that That's far right. back. But now, was it your brother who had a, a breakthrough yeah. and started going? Now, now you're back all the way to 1600s, right? Yeah, it was right around the same time that this is all happening that my older brother got breakthrough on our family genealogy. And he called, he said, you're not going to believe this. I got us back to 1645. We came in as settlers through Virginia. And I said, have I got a Virginia story for you? And I started to tell him about this last battle of the war and he stops and he says that's not that place near Appomattox is it and I said that is exactly where it is he goes oh I just found the documents on it that was our family wow wow so the last battle of the civil war occurred in my family's front yard oh my goodness okay <laughs> so crazy. we now got your family in Virginia but your family's still in Louisiana so there's right. no connection there but what do you find out about you're kind of doing some genealogical studies of your your own what did you find out about your family Right, so I had, a, had someone do some genealogical work for me back in 2002, and I was always hanging on to this one uh, piece that he gave me where of a man named Isaac Lockett. He's believed to be my oldest known family member there in Lake Providence. He shows up in the 1870 census, and in that census, he's 90 years old, so it's probably the place where he was a slave, more than likely. But in that document, Isaac Lockett said that he was originally from Virginia, Whoa, yeah, right. like near the Appomattox Courthouse. Yeah, yeah. Lockett's Farm. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So you, you get all the evidence together, and it turns out that his ancestors owned your ancestors. What did that do to your relationship? I mean, did it, did it color it? Did you, well, was first, there resentment that wasn't there before? Was there? At first, it was astonishment because you know we're, we're prayer guys and don't y'all love it when you see God answering prayer right. and, or, or you know his hand is working in your life with answer prayer that lasted for a good three months <laughs> and then the, all of a sudden the sizzle kind of wore off and I thought hold up your people used to own my people <laughs> 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 what about those ugly stories so all of a sudden I had a face connected to these painful stories in my family but it's the face of somebody that I love and I'm trying to forget how friend's family was ever my family's enemy. And so I actually was, I, I was surprised. I, there was some anger that actually, some resentment that rose up. I don't know if it was what I was feeling around the country or if it was just it was something personal, but it was there. But then I remember that's why God gave me the dream before I ever met Matt. Mm -hmm. yeah. I had to get rid of more baggage. I knew God wanted me to go to a deeper level of forgiveness. So I, I shared this with my brother, my sisters, and, every, and we all honestly went to a deeper level of healing in our family Matt and I, we talked about it one-on-one, -on -one, but mostly it was me doing my business with God. Wow. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm glad I did. Yeah. So glad I did. Yeah. Uh, Matt, what's it like for you? Did you, did you feel this sudden ses, sense of an embarrassment or shame about the family background? Or mm. how, how did you process it, that your people owned his people? Well, like Will said, once the sizzle wore off of, you know, the discovery and the story, the weight of that began to set in and it was, it was uh, heavy and that's putting it mildly to suddenly now I've been listening to this story because see, it wasn't the story that connected us. We didn't know any of this until we had been friends for a decade. And so I've been listening to the story of the kettle and the slaves who prayed for 10 years and now I find out that I'm connected specifically to this story but I'm connected to the worst parts of the story. Mm -hmm. And so that was really hard because, you know, it's easy to talk about this stuff in concepts, you know, and, mm -hmm. and it's, it's other people and it's long, separated by long spans of time. But now suddenly it was very, very personal. Yeah. And I was being confronted, if I could say it that way, I was being confronted by the Lord with uh, the historic pain of the nation, but also as it's expressed through my best friend. Yeah. Because all of that pain and all of those stories has a face and a name, and it's the face of somebody that I love. Wow, wow. Let me ask you a, a difficult question here. So some people say today that uh, there is a place for repentance on the part of white folks for what was done by their ancestors. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we need to say sorry, that we were complicit. In but but the, the immediate resistance that's raised is wait a second, that was them. That was my, that's not me, that was my ancestors. And not only that, you know, I guess I could say as a, 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 a white guy, 
My ancestors didn't even live in this country at the time of mm -hmm. slavery. They didn't emigrate to the United States until the early 20th century. Mm -hmm. So is there a place for us to be saying sorry, even if we don't feel specifically complicit in some way? Yeah, if we could equate sorry to repentance, you know, uh, the, we all deal with this. Like there's always resistance to repentance, right? Because yeah. you have to admit something's not right, something's yeah. wrong. And for me, I think what we need most is God's heart on the matter. And 2 Corinthians 7.10 says that godly sorrow leads to repentance, but worldly grief leads to death. And, and what I would distinguish in this and what's happening in the nation right now is that nothing good comes from shame. Right. And if somebody's trying to put shame on you because of the color of your skin, nothing good's gonna come from it and worldly grief is gonna lead to more death. Right. But if we get God's heart on this issue, if we can connect with God's heart for racial healing in the nation, it's gonna lead to repentance, but that same passage says that it produces salvation. Yeah. Yeah, God's, so, God's so heart. Good. I mean, the word, the word that, that comes to mind is the word empathy. Yeah. You know, God's love for people. And when you see someone who's been hurt, a whole race I, that's I been hurt. I want to be a part of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Yeah. If, if your heart isn't moved and you don't say, oh, I am I'm so sorry that that's been a part of our, our nation's history mm -hmm. and part of our culture and that there are lingering effects of it that we still see, it breaks my heart. Yeah. Exactly, and, and I think you only start to really feel that empathy when you got a brother relationship, a sister relationship, you know, with, with somebody, the friendship that causes you to see things with new eyes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, you guys are both in, into prayer. And uh, if I could ask a cynical question here, does prayer do any, any good when it comes <laughs> to a big issue like racial reconciliation or racial justice? I mean, yeah, yeah let's pray for a job if you don't have a job <laughs> or, you know, if you get a cancer diagnosis, let's pray that the chemo and radiation work. But, you know, but praying for racial reconciliation and justice, does, you know, what good does prayer do? I believe you can't begin the real work of healing and justice without prayer or healing the racial about without prayer. You, you have to involve God in the midst of it. And you look at what he's done in our lives. It was, wasn't some force that brought us together. It was a personal God who wove our lives together, you know, for such a time as this. And so it, it definitely, you, you def, prayer is a very key point to it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We met in a prayer meeting. Like this whole story began <laughs> to be revealed because of prayer and prayer's how you kick up and in, into a, like a providential understanding of your life. I'm a believer. That means I believe that my life has meaning. I believe your life has meaning. God mm -hmm. has a plan and a purpose. But I, you know, I, I don't necessarily approach prayer as like the bless me club. God bless me, bless me, bless me. It's like that's, that's fine. There's a place for that. But prayer, like if we need to see a landscape change in the nation, if I could say it that way, prayer is the heavy earth moving equipment to yeah. actually bring that about. And so we get a partner with yes. God and see what he wants to do. Wow, wow. So let's pray. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's get after it. Yeah. I, I, I like what you said, Will. It, it invites God in, into the process. Yeah. And, and, and what you said, Matt, about the providential working of God, when I read a story like your, your dream king, it's like, who could put a story like this together? The coincidences are way too many. Yeah. There's got to be a script writer, a divine script writer <laughs> yes. behind yes. this script whole writer. thing, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so in, in a bigger sense, um, if someone reads your book and they're saying, I love this story, the Jesus stuff wigs me out a little bit, like, couldn't you just leave that out? Could, could Jesus be left out of this story? Could you just be two guys happen to find that you had this common ancestry and you've gotten to be friends and it's helped you overcome racism. Mm -hmm. I mean, why throw Jesus into it and make it kind of, you know, it's like now a cheesy church story. <laughs> well, Jesus is the go-between in life and he's the mediator and he, he loves to bring together. He's the great intercessor. Yeah. And uh, so without Jesus in the story, um, this, this story has no healing. It really has no, no eternal significance. It, it doesn't become transcendent without Jesus. Yes. Yeah. 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 I just think that without God, it's a sitcom. 
<laughs> totally. <laughs> no, really. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. But, totally. but we're, not, we're not looking to make people go ooh and ah. We're actually trying to, I think this is a, an opportunity where God's lifting the curtain and say, I need people to see my handiwork. Yeah. I want you to see what I've been weaving together, what I've been working on. And, yes. and it's actually that, that you know, revelation is, is what's going to change lives. Yep. So and the good. interesting thing is, is if you don't have Jesus in your life, you don't know the, the one who's weaving this. And you, don't, you don't know the rest of the story. And so you wind <laughs> up putting a period where God is putting a comma. Yeah. He's not finished writing your story. And you, you won't know that without connecting with Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Okay, I, you, you got to tell one last story. Yeah. Um, okay. Because this is really cool. Uh, slavery is over, but there's still this lingering sense down south where blacks should not be educated uh, because then they're going to, you know, they're going to get highfalutin and lose their low station in life and we're not going to be able to hold them, you know, keep them under the thumb. So one of your ancestors, Lucy Lockett, is you know, a, a white landowner down there, and she finds one of her black workers, no longer a slave, but a black worker, educating her son. You're not supposed to be doing this, okay? So what does Lucy do? Yeah, so it's a former slave, and uh, they were doing it in secret because they feared consequences if they were caught, but one night, in walks Lucy Lockett and catches him red-handed, this uh, former slave trying to teach her young son how to read and write. And in that moment, it's, it's a beautiful scene because I think Lucy flips the script. She actually changes the storyline or the direction it's going because she looks at the mother and says, no, what you've chosen to do is very wise. And Lucy actually takes up tutoring this young boy huh. how to read and write. And the reason we know the story in that level of detail is because he wrote about it in his autobiography. So that little boy was Robert Russa Moton. He went on to replace Booker T. Washington as president of Tuskegee Institute. He was an educational advisor to presidents. And in May of 1922, he gave the dedication keynote speech of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., <laughs> where 41 years later, Dr. King would stand on that spot and give the I Have a Dream speech. And exactly 41 years after that speech, Will and I met on the exact same spot. Is that a cool story? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> wow. Okay, so let me extend an invitation to you. Okay, would you like to get to know this Jesus who's got a story for your life, who, who can put the pieces together and help you make sense of things? Okay, around Christ Community Church, we refer to this as the gospel. It's a Bible word that means good news, but the good news starts with bad news. So let, let, let me give it to you in a clipped form here. You know, the bad news is that we start out distanced from God. And the reason is, we, we have this tendency, friends, to go our way instead of God's way. You know this. I mean, every single day of our lives, we don't particularly care what God wants us to do or what God has said don't do. Uh, we pay no attention to his word. We don't want to know what's in his word. Uh, there, there's this uh, natural rebellious spirit, okay? And the trouble with going your way instead of God's way is that when you disconnect from God, you are disconnecting from the source of life. Not, not just physical life. I mean, he's, he's the God who wove you together in your mother's womb. He's the God who gives you every breath you take, every heartbeat you have. But it's, it's not just physical life that he's the source of. He's a life, a spiritual life, connected with the God of the universe. So when you go your way instead of his way, you disconnect from life. And the result, the Bible says, is death. Romans 6 verse 23 says, the wages of sin is death. And when the Bible talks about death, it's not just talking about the physical death you'll die at the end of this life. It's talking about spiritual death, separation from God for all eternity. But God loves you so much. Mm -hmm. God loves you so much. He didn't want you to be separated from him. So God sent his son Jesus to planet earth. And when Jesus uh, not only lived a perfect life, but then laid down his life on the cross. It was purposeful. It wasn't as a martyr. It wasn't uh, someone who had been overpowered by the forces of the day. It was someone who willingly chose to lay down his life on the cross. And his life as the eternal son of God was of infinite worth. What he was doing was dying the death that you and I deserve to die. 
The penalty for going our way instead of God's way, separating from the source of life, the penalty was death. Jesus said, I'll take the death. You deserve to die. But Jesus didn't stay dead. And this is where the bad news becomes good news. Mm -hmm. Jesus was raised from the dead. Jesus is alive today. And if you'll surrender your life to him, Jesus offers you forgiveness, clean slate, and brand new life. And it's not life, just eternal life after you die. It's new life that begins the moment you put your hope and your trust in him. The moment you surrender your life to Christ, Jesus says he's going to come to live on the inside by his spirit. There's going to be an inside-out transformation that starts in your life. You know, i got to believe as you're listening to the story of these guys, there is a winsomeness about them. Is there not? You're saying, whatever they got, that's what I want. Okay, what they got is a relationship with Jesus that began the moment they surrendered their life to him. Now, if you'd like that, I want you to bow with me right now. I'm going to ask you uh, online as well, wherever you're watching this online, just bow with me across our five campuses. We're going to pray a surrender prayer, give you an, an opportunity to cross that line of going your way instead of God's way and turning that all around and now starting to go God's way by surrendering to Christ. Would you pray with me? This surrender prayer, it's got three really important words to it. If you've been around Christ community for any length of time, you've heard us pray this surrender prayer countless times. And even if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus, it's just a good prayer to pray, you know, with some regularity because the three words that make it up are, are words that both unbelievers and believers just need to regularly pray. The first word is sorry. Sorry, maybe the realization has hit you for the first time today because of what you've heard here. That's yeah, true. I've been going my way instead of God's way. Here God is, the, the Lord of the universe, and I've been thumbing my nose at him and doing what I please. Oh, gosh, I am sorry. And you could be sorry, too, for the chaos that's created in your life. You could be sorry for the character of anger or lust or bitterness any manifestation of sinfulness, just say to God, God, I am so sorry that my stubbornness has taken me far from you. Go ahead and put it in your own words. Tell God sorry. The second really important word is the word thanks. Now you know why Jesus had to die on the cross it wasn't just to set a good example. No, 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 no. He was dying the death. You deserve to die. In fact, if you refuse Jesus, if you reject the offer, the invitation today, what you're saying is, you know, I'll just pay for my, my own sins. Trust me, you don't want to do that. Jesus paid for your sins, but you need to say thanks. You need to personalize it. You need to own it. Can you tell me thanks from your heart right now? Oh, Jesus, I can't believe you did that for me. Own it. Invite him to be your savior. Thank him for what he did for you on the cross. So if, if you said sorry and you've said thanks, the third really important word is please. Please become the king of my life. I am abdicating the throne. I'm getting off of the throne. I want you to take the throne. Someone has said that Jesus is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Mm. You know, you're, you're either going to bend your knee to him and say, yes, I want to learn what it means to follow you. Please come into my life as my life leader right now. You, you either say that or there's no Jesus. You, you, you don't just get the, uh, you know, the forgiving Jesus, but you know, reject the leading Jesus. He's coming in as a leader. Can you surrender to him? Can you submit to him right now? Can you say, please come in and begin to change my life from the inside out? Please help me to begin to understand your word so that I can follow it. Lord God, you said through the prophet Jeremiah that when we seek you with all our heart, you will be found by us. 
you don't allow yourself to be found by those who half-heartedly go about it. You, you, you want to know that there's an earnestness on our part. So I pray that you would have heard the earnestness from many hearts today as they've prayed this sorry, thanks, please prayer. Make us new people in Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You know, if you pray that surrender prayer, you just took the first step in a genuine walk with God. But around Christ Community Church, you know, we want people to take subsequent steps. We don't want it to be a, a one-step wonder. We want it to be a daily walk. And so we've put together some information that will help you get going, some materials that will help you get started in a life of following Christ. There's a, uh, there's a Bible in the packet. There's a little booklet that explains what it means to surrender to Christ and follow him. And those packets are available if you're at one of our campuses right now listening to this. At the back of the sections where you're seated, there are next steps packets on those uh, on tables there. And on your way out, if you surrender to Christ, just pick up one of those. It, it's a good way, too, to say, you know, what I did internally here in praying that prayer, I'm going to do something externally just to kind of drive the stake in the ground to make sure that tomorrow morning when you wake up, you remember that you did this. Okay, so pick up one of those Next Steps packets. If you're watching online or you're at a service but you just as soon do this transaction with God online, you could go to our website, ccclife.org slash next steps, and you'll find the, the same information there. And the, the first question you'll be asked is, so did you surrender your life to Christ? And it's a good time to check that box and say, yep, I did it. That's what I did. I'm going to follow Jesus. All right, we're going to sing a closing song in, in just a moment. But before we do, I think it would be appropriate to thank our guests one extra time. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.